Hey everybody, Michael Snyder, Pacific Northwest and California Weather Watch. Today is September 18th, and right now we're going to take a look at the fall winter 2025 predictions. Latest forecasts are out. We'll take a look at La Nina. We'll see what La Nina is and what it typically means here for the west coast of north america so la nina it's coming well it's technically already here and i'll show you what i mean by that right now with the nino 3.4 region at negative 0.5 that is right on the threshold for being in la nina condition so we'll see what the monthly temperature ends up being here but right now we are getting very close to la nina can Nino conditions across Nino 3.4, which is 170 west through 120 west, plus or minus five degrees right across the equatorial Pacific Ocean. So if we take a look here, this goes all the way back from January. So uh, we're going to scroll through here. We're going to, we're in through February. You see March in the upper right here. We're now scrolling on in through April. We didn't know exactly what was going to happen. We thought it was going to be a neutral year. There's a chance to be in a La Nina year. But look at that. You can see the cold tongue starting to emerge off the coast of South America and starting to push across the equatorial Pacific. And this has some far-reaching implications across planet Earth. And I'll show you some more of that here in a moment. But now this is the temperature anomaly for the same area. Uh, again, you see the coast of uh, South America right there. And there's Mexico. And as we go on in through April and then May, you'll see that cold stung tar start to appear here across the equatorial pacific ocean and again we're looking at temperature anomaly right now and between 120 west and 170 which would be somebody somewhere way over here again we've averaged it out and we are technically right there at the threshold that we consider la nina now a wider look at things here kind of tells you a little bit more about the picture this is the pacific ocean you can see where the majority of the warm water usually is across the western pacific and in la nina these straight winds are stronger stronger than normal and they continue to bunch that warm water up here even more across the western pacific ocean and at the end of the run you see as we go through july august and then eventually on in through september you can see that cold tongue coming across and then we've got the warmer than normal conditions here across the western pacific they're typically warmer than normal but when you cool things down you reduce the amount of convection that happens across the equatorial pacific here and in turn the trade winds are stronger and then you get this warmth build up here which has implications like i mentioned across the pacific and really across much of the planet so again looking at temperature anomaly one more time you can see we are above normal here for the western pacific and this is actually going through last January, our last near near La Nina conditions, I should say. And then we scroll on in through March and we'll go to April here. And then you can see that cool tongue start to approach as we go through May and then June, July, creeping out across the equatorial Pacific. We'll go all the way out in towards July now. And now we're on in towards August and you can clearly see it taking shape here across the equatorial Pacific. So again, what happens in the tropics? I've mentioned this before. It does not stay in the tropics. The earth is just one big heat transfer machine. And as this heat builds up across the equatorial regions, it wants to go towards the polar areas and that cold air wants to drop down and you know the earth wants to balance itself out so again during la nina trade winds increase convection increase across some of the western pacific ocean and that's of course water heated by the sun you get this upwelling here that stretches across the pacific ocean However, this is not the case during the entire season. And I'll go over some of that here more in a moment. We have something called the Madden-Julian Oscillation that can have interseasonal variability that has big impacts on the west coast of North America. So a couple of reanalysis here. This is a reanalysis of El Nino. And again, you can kind of see how we've got the, the westerly anomalies across the equatorial Pacific kind of bunching things up here. And you got warmer water, so you get deeper convection out across the equatorial Pacific towards the coast of South America in the Nino 3.4 region. And there's a GFS reanalysis shows it similar. La Nina, the opposite is true. Again, the stronger trade winds are here and you get cooler water, less convection. So this in turn affects circulation patterns across much of the Pacific Ocean, including much of the planet Earth. So here you can just imagine this is the Western Pacific and here's Siberia up there. And, you know, there's a pretty good clash of air masses going on that comes off the coast of Asia there and sometimes right across Japan. And those are known as jet streams. And those jet streams can have big impacts on what forms across the Pacific Ocean, what eventually impacts places like the Pacific Northwest, even down towards California. 
So one more look at here, precipitable water. You can see just the lack of it across the northern polar regions in Antarctica versus what is going on, the steamy hot water bath here across the equatorial areas. And this heat wants to go northbound, and it does so in the form of atmospheric rivers. It does it aloft. All kinds of stuff is going on. And you can see this atmospheric river here pointed towards British Columbia. But yeah, that's the heat transfer process that goes on across the planet Earth. And then you get, as you get this heat transfer process taking place, you can see the warmer air to the south and the much colder air there across the Gulf of Alaska. In this case, this is not a forecast or anything. I'm just giving you an example of a powerful jet stream there at 18,000 feet with that clash of air masses, the jet stream. It's no you know, anomaly here that the jet stream is set up right on the strongest boundary between that cold and warm air. And this goes for higher levels in the atmosphere here as well, although up towards, you know, 30,000, 39,000, whatever you name it, and you get this big temperature gradient and you're forming those strong winds. So, uh, like I mentioned, you know, you're getting high pressure and, and in turn ridges can lead to troughs, troughs can lead to ridges and uh, so on and, and around the planet. Now, Nino 3.4, you need five consecutive three month running mean sea level temperatures anomalies in the Nino 3.4 region. Uh, to, to reach that threshold of La Nina. We didn't quite get there last year. So I know people are saying, yeah, we were in La Nina conditions. Well, we were for two or three months, but it did not encompass the whole season. Probably going to be officially categorized as a neutral year when all is said and done. So taking a look here, uh, there's also a few other things that come into play. And again, actually, I may have mentioned all these actually already. So sea surface temperatures in the real analysis during a La Nina or El Nino here. La Nina would be... Um, the opposite of this. So this is El Nino and you can see the warmer water here. Outgoing long wave radiation is uh, more clouds across this area. That's what the blue uh, designates and the meridional wind here. Meridional. I have a hard time pronouncing that sometimes. I forget. Uh, and also you've got the surface wind here as well. A little bit more out of the west convection bunching up across the equatorial Pacific. Sea level pressure also lower as you can see across the equatorial Pacific Ocean in the Nino 3.4 region. So this is typically what we get along the west coast here. You can kind of see this is just kind of a broad brush picture of things here. But you get the variable polar jet stream here ridging kind of classifies and kind of is a main characteristic of these La Nina winters. And you get these jet streams diving down to the north and northwest, wetter and a bit colder here, generally speaking, across the Pacific Northwest. Really good for the snow season, and snowboarders and skiers up across some of the higher terrain, um, usually averaging things out anyway. So again, what happens in the tropics does not stay in the tropics. You can see all that moisture across the equatorial regions trying to get back towards the north uh, during this big heat transfer process. So again, a broad brush, I thought I'd show the entire globe because some other areas across the planet have things they look for during La Nina winters. And you can kind of see one of the only areas that overlaps on this map, kind of interestingly enough, is right across the Pacific Northwest where you get the cool and wet and you get the wet there kind of overlapping right across the area. And you can see not good for some of the Gulf states. They're generally below normal precipitation that can extend all the way back across the Sierra Madre in Mexico there as well. So... Over the last few months, you can see in June, we were actually odds on favorite to be in neutral conditions. Then July, you started to see that peak out towards La Nina. And then as we got the latest update here, probably La Nina conditions, the odds on favorite as we go on into the early portion of the new year, then neutral starts to again rear its head as we go on in towards the springtime. And you see the El Nino start to eventually creep up a little bit more here as we get towards next spring. A little bit of a chance of that and actually starts to outweigh La Nina as we go on in through next spring. So there's other things we look at here as well. Uh, higher pressure, generally speaking, you know, it depends on La Nina versus El Nino. We take these pressure readings over to Tahiti versus Darwin, and you can kind of see what the atmosphere is resembling La Nina versus El Nino. And again, you can have variation in, in a La Nina or an El Nino, for example, Madden-Julian oscillation plays into that. So La Nina conditions, again, deep convection out across the Western Pacific. And again, Darwin, Tahiti, you can imagine the pressure is going to be lower here in La Nina conditions and then stronger trade winds. Now, uh, the Madden-Julian oscillation, like I've been mentioning here, is kind of an intra-seasonal, gives some intra-seasonal variability when El Nino is going. Kind of the main driver is El Nino, but you've got the Madden-Julian oscillation, and that can affect ridges and troughs. That's why we don't stay necessarily in the cool and wet period the entire winter or fall winter and on in through early spring across the Pacific Northwest, because we do have other factors at play. It's just not El Nino, and that's it. 
And you can see uh, sometimes they can, these can be in phase and they can be out of phase. You can imagine that when you are in phase, you know, you're getting some wetter conditions here and certain conditions you're both in phase and you're drier, depending on if you're in La Nina or El Nino. So the Madden Julian oscillation also has some big impacts as well. And that is an area of tropical convection that generally moves across the entire planet in about a cycle of 30 to 60 days. So when it's crossing the Pacific, that can switch things up. And again, kind of eastward movement here. You can see the stormy and wet that moves across the equatorial regions and different phases you can see contribute to different jet stream configurations and whatnot as those propagate across the equatorial areas. So as we go through the, the CFS, it, it's continuing to show us into this La Nina pattern. You can clearly see the cold tongue as we go through November, December, January, February, and then we start to back things off a little bit as we go through the spring times. You can see the CFS in pretty good agreement that we're probably headed towards a La Nina this round. No guarantee guarantees because some of them still do have us in a kind of a chilly neutral condition there. Now the European kind of interestingly enough, I'm just going to show this for kind of fun, but you can see the European's been predicting, um, actually let's go to April, 2025. It, this the dotted line is actually what's occurring and you can see the ensemble members were actually showing hey we might be a neutral or el nino so you can kind of see that the european wasn't handling this well and you can kind of see even colder than the coldest ensembles we went through june and july in the june forecast there and eventually trying to catch back up you can see the entire forecast if i scroll back and forth here how it was above that uh, you know the warmer neutral and maybe el nino and then finally the forecast has been catching up as we've gone all the way through september and now the european of saying yeah we're probably going to be in an el nino so this is uh since 2002 and you can see the only years with no snowfall were all el nino years every single la nina year has had measurable snowfall going all the way back to 1950 for SeaTac. and last year's chilly neutral year had 2.8 you can see our triple dip la nina is right there and they're very interesting 2019 storm there in february if you remember that bumped up our totals there in a week La Nina we ended up getting some pretty good snow and the famous 2008 December was indeed a La Nina year so this is for Seattle look at this raw data here so this is rainfall over just these months here I took out uh, every, everything between May and September here and just kind of let this run through and you can see that La Nina years are wetter for Seattle there's, a new, there's El Nino and Neutral are both a bit drier. If we go to snow, I mean, huge difference there, really, uh, relatively speaking. I think this goes back to 1950. Uh, I'll have to double check, but I'm pretty sure this goes back to 1950. We can clearly see a difference between La Nina, El Nino, and Neutral conditions. Now, wind, also windier as well, as you can see, overall average of these months is towards 43 miles per hour, windier than both El Nino and neutral conditions. But did you notice that here, the December El Nino is actually technically the windiest month at SeaTac. So kind of interesting there. But overall, La Nina is a windier. Now, in temperature as well for Seattle, you see 44.7, definitely chillier than uh, El Nino conditions. And, you know, this is just a mean temperature. And when you spread that out over an entire season, that's a pretty big difference. Uh, neutral years, though, just slightly warmer. So fog, something interesting here as well. Actually, the least foggy of all three as well. Look at a neutral tend to be even more foggy than both El Nino and La Nina here as well. Now, <coughs> here's what everybody wants to see is the seasonal temperature outlook. This is September 18th, October, November, December. Well, we got equal chances here across a lot of the region, maybe some above normal for Oregon, Idaho, and some of Southern Montana, but we got the above normal precipitation signal showing up here. Then as we go on in through December, January, and February, look at this classical Adenia stuff showing up. We got the below normal here across Pacific Northwest again. Right now, the above staying across portions of Idaho and Montana, however, we scroll off into the new year in 2026, January, February, and March, and look at that below normal signal with us here for the Pacific Northwest all the way on in through March, early spring. That's kind of typical for La Nina. Excuse me. Now, taking a look at Portland, Oregon, USA snow. An interesting signal here. La Nina, definitely more snowy than El Nino, but look at the neutral years. Actually, the snowiest of the three for Portland, Oregon. And we're going to scroll off again here. If I Did I lose my entire thing? I think that might be the end of the slides. But anyway, yeah, so 
interesting stuff here. And if I back this up, again, we'll go over that one more time. There's January, February, March. And again, below normal. You can see December, January, February there. And there we go over the next three months, including October. But yeah, interesting stuff. So let me know what you guys think. Are you looking forward to another La Nina here in the Pacific Northwest? Hopefully we can get some fun snowfall events. One of my favorite things to cover here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but yeah, let me know what you guys think. And uh, hopefully you guys are having a good day. Click like and subscribe. We'll do this all again tomorrow. And I will talk to you guys then.